Good evening and welcome to our webinar, Handling the Holidays. I'm Pat Loader, the Executive Director of the Compassionate Friends. Before we begin, let me mention that all attendees are muted. To ask a question, you will need to type it into your question area on your screen's control panel. To get to the control panel, click on the arrow on the top right side of your screen. Our presenter will be taking questions at the end of her presentation, and we will do our very best to get to as many questions as possible. I could tell you what a brilliant presenter we have this evening. I could list all her degrees and the initials she has after her name. I could list all the books she's written. But I could never begin to tell you how many hearts she's touched and how many people she has helped to heal. So let me just say, our presenter this evening is an author, an internationally known speaker and presenter, but we in TCF know her as Big A's mom and our friend, Darcy Sims. Welcome, Darcy. Hi, Pat. Thanks for having me on tonight. Well, you know, it's, it's the holiday time. I'm looking at the calendar, and it says it's the holiday time. And I'm looking at the pumpkin that's kind of um, smashed on my porch at the moment, thinking I really need to take that down and put up the turkeys. But I was in the store the other day and saw New Year's decorations. So I have apparently missed Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and we're now into New Year's. I need to hurry because it's going to be Valentine's Day in a week. It is the holiday time, and the world is filled with music, tinsel, and glitter. Everything seems to sparkle, and there's always so much to do. There's too much to do. It's a festive time of year, filled with joyous occasions and family gatherings. But when your family circle's been broken by death, the only thing that may sparkle this season may be tears. The holidays only serve to remind us of the empty space at the table and the hole in our heart. The holidays are a time when the past and the present collide. We either try to recreate the wonderful memories of our past or clean the slate completely and start all over. When the family fabric has been torn apart by death, the holiday season becomes one of the most difficult experiences that we can endure. From Halloween to New Year's, it's a season filled with despair and renewed grief. No one can grieve for you. We each have to walk that path all by ourselves. The most important thing to remember is that this is your time and your grief, and do whatever is comfortable and right for you. Your family and friends want to help, and perhaps the best gift that they could give you is the love and patience that we each need to help us through this season of despair. The holidays are coming, and I'm not ready. I don't think I'll ever be ready. Look at that. That's exactly what I look like today, and I'll bet that's what almost all of us look like. You know, we start out frozen, unable to feel much of anything. We function. We move through early grief as if on automatic pilot or powered only by batteries. We feel nothing. But eventually, we begin to defrost or thaw, and that's when grief gets harder. We search for answers and survival guides. However, each of us has our own path to follow. We are as unique as snowflakes. Our grief is unique. Our solutions will be as well. There's no single right answer for surviving the coming holidays. You know, it's, it's been a long time since I endured my first holiday season. 36 years, but even now, my heart still sometimes echoes with emptiness as I roll out the cookie dough or hang his special ornament on the tree. I think that hurt will always be with me, but now I know it only is a momentary hurt, not like the first year when grief washed over me in waves, each new wave hurling me deeper and deeper into despair. And it's not like the second year's hurt when I found myself both surprised and angry that it hadn't gone away yet. I grew anxious about my sanity in the third year, I think my family did too, when I found my hands still shaking when I unwrapped those precious ornaments. When was I going to get better? When was grief going to end? Was I doomed to suffer at every holiday for the rest of my life? 
But it was the year the little satin balls wouldn't stay on the tree that I finally gave up. Several years after our son died, we found ourselves in the far northern regions of the United States. Tony was a pilot with Strategic Air Command flying B-52s, and we lived in a little tiny Air Force base way up on the Canadian border, right on Lake Superior, and we had two feet of snow. We had 40 feet of snow. My husband was away on deployment. Allie, six-year-old daughter, and I were alone for the holidays. I was deep in despair, and I decided to cancel Christmas. What a Hello? We didn't even get a tree. I didn't send out cards. There were no spicy smells of cookie baking and no twinkling lights at our house. But by Christmas Eve, I knew something was terribly wrong. Instead of feeling better because there was no holiday spirit in our house, it felt even worse. It really felt even worse. So we bundled up against the cold and went foraging in the woods for a tree. But it was so cold, like 25 below zero, that we only lasted a few minutes. And we ended up at the tree lot on the corner, late on Christmas Eve. Do you know what kind of a tree you get on Christmas Eve? We had our choice of three, and all of them together did not make a decent tree. So we adopted the best of the lot and dragged this poor thing home. We got out the lights and decorations, and then I remembered why I had gotten married. Men do lights. However, we were strong women, and we struggled, and eventually we had a tree. Well, kind of. We sat in the dark and watched our little tree twinkle in the cold darkness, but as we watched, one of the little satin balls fell off the tree, and then another one fell off, and then some of the tinsel fell off the branches. And then some of the needles fell off. And then a branch sagged and it fell off. And as we watched, our tree slowly undecorated itself. Oh, Mom, Allie cried. Are we that sad? She accused me. We killed the tree. She said, are we that sad that we killed our tree? Had our grief so permeated our house, our lives, that even a Christmas tree could not survive? Big A's death was more than enough. It seemed like we lost love and hope as well. So I threw that tree out that night, leaving a trail of shedding needles in the carpet and all along the snowbank. We went to bed, and we prayed for spring. But spring didn't come the next morning, and I knew we could not let everything die. So in the middle of that Christmas day, now so many years passed, we returned to that bare stick of a tree, now frozen at a very odd angle in a snowbank. And carefully, we hung those branches with popcorn strings and tinsel. I'm sure we were a strange sight that afternoon to the neighbors. But with a mixture of tears and snowflakes, we began to let the hurt out and make room for healing to begin. With each kernel strung, we found ourselves remembering. Now some of those memories came with pain. And others began to grow within us, warming the heart places that I thought had frozen long ago. By the time we finished, we were exhausted. Memories take a lot of work. We had a tree, although it was not the one we were expecting. But then, who expected a child to die? But we had one, decorated with tears and memories, sadness, and remembered laughter. I did discover that at 25 below zero, when you cry, the tears leave little icy streaks on your cheek, and they freeze just about just above the, the mouth line. And so we really had icy stuff all over our faces, too. I kept a little tiny twig from that frozen tree to remind me of what I almost lost. I tried to cancel Christmas. I tried to toss out love because it sometimes hurts. That was the year we chose to let Christmas come back. And that was the year we learned that life can become good and whole and complete once again. Not when I tried to fill up the empty spaces left by Big A, but when we realized that love creates new spaces in our heart 
and expands the spirit and deepens the joy of simply being alive. When we learned to let the hurt out, there was finally room for hope and love to return. While most of the world seems to be addressing holiday cards and planning holiday menus, we, the bereaved, are struggling with other concerns, like how long does grief last? Will the holidays always be this awful? What do we do with the empty place at the table? What is there to be thankful for this year? Maybe nothing seems quite right in your house or in your heart this season. Can you ever be happy again? Will the sights and sounds of the holiday season ever touch you again? Will there ever be light again? We hold our breath and hope the holidays go quickly. We doubt that we can endure too long. We sit in the dark because we think we have forgotten how to turn on the lights. We wish for some sign of hope in this season of icicles, some magical sign that will keep us going until the warmth of spring arrives. We turn on all the lights in an attempt to chase away the grief. So why is holiday grief so hard? Holidays represent some of the special moments in our lives that we shared with our child. The holidays are interwoven with our memories, and when we face the holidays alone, some of those memories can become almost unbearable, especially in the early months and years of grief. When we're surrounded by the sights and sounds of the approaching holidays, we're reminded again and again that our lives have changed forever. Grief that may have already settled into a slightly more familiar place or a routine in our life suddenly intensifies. We may feel disconnected from the people and events around us. I don't care how long you have been bereaved. The holidays are a special challenge to each of us. Maybe all you want to do this year is for January to come quickly. Too late. It's the holidays and we're stuck. Red, green, bright, shiny, or blue. The holidays are here, and what can we do besides write very bad poetry? We have expectations of the season, each other and ourselves. We have a mental picture of how things ought to be. But often those expectations are based more on fantasy than reality, and we measure success and happiness by how close we come to those sometimes difficult expectations. So I want you to remember this. Handling the holidays is not a question of how to eliminate pain and grief from our lives, but how we can learn to live with the hurt and grief rather than be consumed by it. Although you may feel like a scattered puzzle, pieces scattered all over the floor, perhaps we can rearrange the pieces, reshuffle them, and piece them together to form a different picture. Our task is to learn to live with what we've got instead of what we wanted. So maybe tonight we can find a few thoughts to guide us as we navigate the twists and turns of the grief journey through the holidays. So I sat and thought about a couple of holiday tips, some things that worked for me, and thought I'd like to share those with you. So here are a couple of tips. Become aware of your feelings and acknowledge them. Tears, depression, anger, Guilt and loneliness are all a natural part of grief. These feelings may return again and again during the holiday season, as well as other earlier symptoms that you may have experienced. Once you can acknowledge them and embrace them, they will dissipate more quickly. Do not be afraid or ashamed of your emotions. Remember, we never have to apologize for what we feel. We might have to apologize for what we do with what we feel. But your feelings are yours and you have the right to them. So let's be realistic and patient with ourselves. Grief hurts, so be kind and patient. Try to forgive yourself for surviving the death of your child. Let go of the guilt that you've experienced if you happen to find yourself enjoying a moment or two of the holiday season. <gasps> we shouldn't be enjoying ourselves. If you've already had one good feeling in your grief journey, you already know what I mean when I say that guilt comes back and finds us. We shouldn't be happy. We shouldn't be having a good moment. But remember this. Your child enjoyed the holidays with you. So let those memories surround you now. So let's get rid of the word ought and should. Let's leave those words out of this holiday season. 
If you were looking in a mirror right now and you said the word ought, you would see how ugly your face is when you say the word ought. You ought to do this, or you ought to be feeling this way, or the even better negative, you oughtn't be, I love that, you oughtn't be doing that. So if people are giving you the shoulds this holiday season, or worse, you're telling yourself what you should or ought do, I want you to look right in the mirror, be very kind and compassionate, say this very, very clearly. Please don't should on me. If you don't say it clearly, it comes out kind of nasty. We don't need to add any more ugliness or nastiness to the world. But let's leave that word ought and should out of this holiday season. Well, let's plan ahead. Let's plan ahead and make lists. I learned as a bereaved person, I lost my mind. Big A died but I lost my mind. I couldn't remember anything. I had to make lists and then I had to stick those lists on the refrigerator with little refrigerator magnets because I kept losing the lists. We can't remember anything so make a list of everything you have to do this holiday. Sit down as soon as this is over and make a list of everything that you usually do that you used to do during the holidays. Write it all down. Did you send out cards? Did you decorate? Are you the chef and do you create the giant feast for 482 people coming to your dinner? Did you do all the shopping? Are you known all over the neighborhood as the decorated holiday place? Make a list of everything, big things and little things that you do to make it the holidays. And then I want to ask some questions. Do you really enjoy doing this? Go through everything you wrote down with a pen and ask yourself, do I really like doing that? If the answer is no, cross it off. Do others expect me to do this? Is this something that they expect me to do? If they expect you to do it and you like it, keep it on. If somebody expects you to do it and you don't like it, this is the year to take that off your list. Grief is a thief and grief steals not only our loved ones, not only our children, our grandchildren, our brothers and sisters, but grief steals all our energy, and we don't have enough energy just to get through a regular holiday season, let alone doing everything else that we ought to be doing. Can somebody else do something on this list for you? Can you assign this task to somebody else? Now, they may not do it as well as you do or like you do, but could you give that chore to somebody else? If the answer is yes, boy, it comes off of your list. Just draw a line right through it right now. Now here's a harder question. Look at your list. Will it still be the holidays if I don't do this? If I don't send cards out, will it still be the holidays? More than likely, yes. So if you don't have the energy this year, don't send out cards. Maybe send an email greeting. Maybe post something on Facebook. Send out a card in March and tell people you're early for next year. Send out a New Year's card or don't send one out at all. And then ask yourself, well, what would happen if I didn't do that? What would happen if I didn't decorate the house? I mean, would, would, would the economy fall apart? Would we, would we move into World War X? What, what would happen if I didn't buy presents? What would happen if I didn't have a gigantic meal? Ask yourself these questions. Look through your list and be more practical this year. You have only a limited amount of energy, so do what you can. Let's change a few things. I mean, everything else has changed. The whole landscape has changed. So let's change a few things. See what happens if you would have dinner at a different time or a different place. Or maybe you don't have dinner at all. Maybe you have brunch. Do you know McDonald's is probably open? Some people go have Chinese on Christmas Day. Some people go see a movie. Attend a different church service if you want to. Open presents at a different time. Don't give up having presents. But maybe you open them at a different time. Ask others to take over hosting the holidays. If you don't have the energy to throw a holiday party, ask someone else. Don't ask them, tell them. Say, you know, I voted you to do the holiday party this year. They probably won't know what to say except, oh, I, I, I could never do it. I, we always come to your house and say, well, I'm moving this year and I'm not telling you where I'm going. Change something. Send a New Year's note instead of holiday cards. Do something different. 
everything else has changed. We can't go back to what used to be. We can only move forward into what is and what will be. So I want you to work at lifting depression. You know, we sometimes wait for other people to make us happy. But this year, take responsibility for your own happiness. We can't wait for someone else to give us joy. Think of the things you like and give yourself a treat. Create your own healing environment. Hot chocolate, soup, cookies, no vegetables, unless you really, really, really like them. There's nothing better than a hot cup of tea or a hot cup of cocoa in the middle of the day to kind of lift our spirits. And don't forget to turn on the lights. Don't forget to turn on those lights. It's so dark and gloomy at 4.30 in the afternoon now, wherever we are. So put those lights on. Make sure there's always a light on before you leave the house so that when you come home, there'll be a light on. Some people even like to leave a radio on or sometimes even the TV just so when they walk in the house, there's noise and they don't have to walk into a house full of silence. Share your holidays. You don't have to be alone. You can go out. Find some group that might need your presence. Go visit a nursing home. Go visit a daycare center. Volunteer at a soup kitchen or a shelter. Our family does that every year. We go and work at a food bank, and it has become part of our new family tradition. And just greeting other people and wishing them a happy holiday and being able to give them something out of the food pantry kind of lifts our spirits as well. Invite a child to go for a walk or find a kid in the neighborhood and go sledding. You know, you don't have to have a child to go sledding. You can always say that your kid had to go in the house and go potty. And sometimes we just want to make angels in the snow. If you're going to cry, however, make sure it's above 40 below or those tears freeze right on your face. Take somebody shopping or just go window shopping. Do something to share your holidays so you don't have to be all alone. And now look at that one. Take care of yourself. Take care of you. That means eat right, whatever that means for you. Exercise, or at least watch somebody else. Go buy the shoes. Put them on. Walk around the living room a couple times. That's a start. If you can't do anything else, vacuum very vigorously. That's exercise, too. You could gift wrap some vegetables or broccoli. Get plenty of rest. Chocolate is always a good idea. And no one ever wanted salad. I have never heard anybody say, boy, I'm stressed. Let's have a salad. But if you like salad, have it. Follow it with a small bit of dark chocolate and we'll be okay. Be nice to you. If nothing else, get out the scrapbooks and jog your memory. Take care of you. You're worth it. Decorate something. Don't throw out the whole season. I already tried that. I told you what happened when I tried to throw out Christmas. So decorate something, even if it's a dead tree stuck in a frozen snowbank. If you don't feel like decorating the whole house, then try just doing a room or a corner or maybe just a table. Ask the cemetery if you're allowed to decorate the grave. Big A's buried in a military cemetery, and we're not allowed by regulation to put anything on the graves other than a small, fresh bouquet of flowers that have to be removed within 24 hours. But I love driving by other cemeteries and seeing all the wonderful things that people can put up. Pumpkins for Halloween, and, and right now people are putting up menorahs and, and, the, and the little luminarios, the paper bags with candles in them. It just go decorate the grave if you're allowed to. Do whatever feels right for you and your family. You don't owe anybody an explanation. Just do what feels right for you, as long as it doesn't lead you to tall buildings, sharp instruments, or heavy drugs. So that means hang the stockings, if you like. That first year, we have beautiful stockings that are custom made for each of us in our family. They're, they're absolutely heirlooms. And that first year after Big A died, I got out the stockings and cried for several days. And then I started to hang them up, and, and I got to his, and, and I didn't know what to do with it. I, I didn't know if I should hang it on the mantle with everyone else's or, or what I should do with it. So I wandered around the house with his stocking, and finally Allie looked at me and she said, what are you doing with my brother's stocking? I said, I don't know where to put it. She said, well, he's still a part of the family, isn't he? And I hung it up right next to hers, and it's there to this day. We've added some more stockings, but Big A's stocking is there every year. 
I have noticed over the years that sometimes people put little notes in that stocking. You know, I've never read them, but I have a feeling that those are love notes to brother, to son, to grandson, and now to uncle. Don't forget to reconnect to your source. The holiday season can be a time of reflection and renewal, of recollection and reconnection. So I want you to set aside 20 minutes each day to catch your breath. Make yourself a cup of tea, put your feet up, and turn on the answering machine. And just kind of sit in the silence. We are hurrying so much to run through our grief. And sometimes I think the best thing we could do is just to sit down in it and to find that source of calm, to find that source of quiet, to find that source of love that has not gone away. So while we're at it, let's share a memory. Have an I Remember evening. We have done that for years now and have such fun doing it. Get out the scrapbooks. Get out the home movies. Get out all the photographs. Have an I Remember evening and ask everybody to share something. Plan a special moment. Plan a special moment or a memorial for your child. Plant a living Christmas tree in the yard. Or maybe place a favorite flower on your breakfast table or on the mantelpiece. Put your favorite photo of your child in a new frame this year and keep it where you can see it every single day. Include your child in your table blessing as your family gathers to celebrate the season. And don't forget to serve your child's favorite treat or bake those very special cookies. Yeah, they're going to be salty a little bit with some extra tears. But as you pass those cookies along the table, it comes with a memory story. And we can talk about all the memories and all the fun we had when we started to make those cookies or whatever they are. Spend a special moment with your child and invite other people to do the same thing. Well, the holidays are of nothing else but a gigantic shopping expedition. So shop if you must. If you've got the energy to go shopping, awesome. Make out a list before you go, though. Remember, we have grief brain, and we can't remember where we are, where we're going, or why we're going there. So you might also want to write on your shopping list the location of your car, or put a beacon on the top so when you open your car door or press your car key clicker in the parking lot, that beacon will go off, and we can find where we parked. Go out on your good days or in your good times. Now, everybody's going to tell you to go out early in the morning because nobody's there. Nobody is there, but I'm not going out early in the morning. 3 o'clock in the morning is not bad if you're in, an in a 24-hour store. A different group of people come at 3 o'clock in the morning, and we sometimes have some very good sharing times right there at the cash register. Take a friend along. Take a friend along, but a friend who doesn't have any money in their pocket or any agenda, just so you're not by yourself. Shop when the stores are the least busy if you can find that time. And try catalog shopping. Or I've gotten into holiday IOUs a lot. And sometimes I just give Miss Darcy, our granddaughter, the catalog and say, here you go, have a good time. Some days I just can't face going out into the crowds. And I will tell you the first time I went back to a toy store after Big A died, I walked out and I didn't go back for another year. So I want you to hold on to your wallet. As much as we would like to, we can't buy grief away. We can't fill that empty space just by spending money. <laughs> but if you're going shopping, I want you to take a credit card. Don't take any cash. Just, just take a credit card, but not yours. So whose credit card should we take? Do you remember all those people at the funeral who came up to us and said, now, if there's anything you need, don't hesitate to call. <laughs> Pick up the phone and say, can I borrow your MasterCard? I just need your visa for about 20 minutes. And some of you had four and 500 people at the funeral. I mean, you've got it made. Just a few minutes with each credit card, and you will absolutely be happy. And they will never again say, if you just need something, call me. Now, now this one, buy your child a gift. This one really seemed very odd the first time I heard it, 
we were in a group, not compassionate friends at the time, but just a group of families who had had their child die, when I heard this suggestion. And it was the November meeting, and they said, now, don't forget to bring your gift next, year, next month. And I went, what? What do you mean? They said, oh, we all go shopping, and we buy our child a gift. I said, really? I didn't want to do that. In fact, I, just, I, I didn't say no out loud. I just shook my head and said, no, that's not for me. But on the way home, I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, these people have been bereaved a little longer than me, and some of them have tried it, so maybe it'll work, and maybe it won't. The nice thing about being bereaved is if it doesn't work, you can always just stop in the middle and, and say, whoop, I'm bereaved, and, and leave. So we decided we'd try it. So we were on our way to Toys R Us when we started to have an argument. And I wasn't expecting an argument. We're going to go buy a toy. But Tony wanted to buy a toy for the age Big A would have been that year. And I wanted to buy a toy for the age he was when he died. And big sister, Allie, said very clearly from the back seat, if my brother was alive, he would want me to have the Barbie dream house. And I looked at her and I said, if your brother was alive and you had the Barbie dream house, he would probably have sat on it by now. So you come with me, Missy. So we continued to argue all the way up till we got to the doors of the Toys R Us store. We walked inside. We still were arguing. And I finally looked at Tony and said, just... Just go do whatever it is you want to do. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And we went our separate ways. And that was the first time I realized that we were not going to do this together, that we each grieve alone. We don't have to be alone when we grieve, but we may not go down the same path. So we got back together at the cash register a little while later. Tony had a gift for the age Big A would have been that year. And I had a gift for the age he was when he died. And Allie did not have the Barbie Dream House. I want you to take that gift home, and I want you to wrap it in the most incredible wrapping paper you can find. I want you to make it the most beautiful gift that you can find. Put a bow on it. Do everything you can possibly imagine. Make this a wonderful gift. And then I want you to put a tag on it that says boy or girl, and an age range, 10, 12, 8, 1. And then I want you to find someone to whom you can give this gift, who will then take this gift and present it to a child who is in need of a present. I don't want you to hand it to a child. What we did with this group was we all brought them back together. We met at a church, and we had asked the pastor of this church if he would mind taking these gifts down to the homeless shelter in town for us. And he was delighted. He said, well, don't you all want to go? And we said, no, we don't, but we'd like these gifts delivered. And, and you know what was really funny is when I put my gift down on the table that night at the meeting, this beautifully wrapped gift, something incredible happened that I could never have imagined. I realized as I was placing that gift on the table that I was a mother who had no child to give a gift to, giving a gift to a child who didn't have a mother to receive it from. And in that moment, that circle of love that I thought had been broken forever was mended just like that. Buy a gift and give it away. And you too will then begin to understand that the circle of love can never be broken. We continue to do that to this day. We all go as a family to buy a gift, wrap it up, and give it away. Now I will tell you that Tony does not buy Big A a gift that would be appropriate for his age now because that would be a car or a house or a vacation in Hawaii. So we're back to giving a gift for a child of any age. Just something we see that we know that he would have loved or would still love. And that circle of love surrounds us and the holidays aren't quite so hard for just a moment. So, what else have we got? Let me see if I can make this work. Okay, there we go. All right, that was why it was hard to come up because it's hard, talking about the hardest one. What do we do with the empty chair? Well, first of all, you, you have an empty chair. So you could rearrange the, the whole table. 
I didn't realize that we had assigned seating in our family. I bet most of you don't realize that we have assigned seating, but we do. So maybe you rearrange all the chairs. Maybe you eat in a different room. You don't have to eat in the dining room. TV trays in front of the TV. Stand around the pot. Hand if everybody a spoon. They can just dip into the pot. That would be OK. Or leave the chair and honor all of those who cannot be with you today, but who remain within the family circle. We're a military family for generations. And it's a tradition in the military that if someone is away on deployment, or someone has died, or no longer able to be with you today, that we have an empty chair at the table. And so we have always had an empty chair. There are a lot of people now who actually are eligible to sit in that empty chair, not just Big A, but my dad and my mom and Tony's parents and a couple of other family members. We set the table. That place is set. No food is served, no wine is poured. But that seat is there. And it represents for us all of those who cannot be with us today, but are, who are still within our family circle. And a couple of years ago, I found a beautiful real rose dipped in 24 karat gold. Just, it was so exquisite. And I bought it, and I placed it on the, on the place. Didn't tell anybody. And when they all came in, they saw, oh, look at that rose. How perfect. A rose symbolizes eternal love. And because it's dipped in 24 karat gold, it will never tarnish. And it just reminds us that even though they are not within hug's reach, our children, our loved ones, are always within the reach of our heart. They are a part of us. Include them in your blessing, and that chair won't be quite as empty. So maybe, maybe the easiest thing to do, and maybe the most difficult thing to do is the next one, is to find something to be thankful for. So what I want you to do while you're sitting listening to me for a moment, I want you to start to think of the gifts that your child, your grandchild, your brother and sister gave to you while they were alive. Now I'm not talking about the gifts we unwrapped and, and immediately started to play the video game or, or tried on the fur coat, mm, that's a nice gift, or, or said, oh, thanks for the vacuum cleaner. I'm talking about another kind of gift. I'm talking about the gift of the spirit, gift of the soul, if you were. Let me give you an example. Did you ever laugh when your child was alive? <laughs> of course we did. I mean, I can laugh just thinking about some of the things. That's, that's a gift, I mean. Think of that for a minute. Were they your best friend in addition to being your child? Did they give you the gift of courage or, or the gift of, of honor or the gift of tenacity or the gift of aggravation? Yeah, they did. I want you, whatever gift you're thinking of, I want you to write it down on a little piece of paper. And then I want you to get a box. I don't care what size box. Big box, little box. Get a refrigerator box. Get a, a, a little tiny box. I was talking the other night doing this for, for someone else, and, and the dad kind of smiled for a moment, and he said, how about a jewelry box? I said, oh, that would be perfect. And he went on to describe that he had a 10-year-old daughter who'd recently died. And she had a wonderful jewelry box that when you open it, had the little ballerina that went around and played song. And, and he said he'd, he'd actually put it in the box to give away. But he was going to go get that jewelry box back. And he was going to put his little strip of paper in that box. And I said, then I want you to keep thinking of other gifts that you got. Courage, laughter, companionship, joy happiness, a sense of foreverness, a sense of wonder, and write all of those down on pieces of paper and put them in your box. And then I want you to put that box someone, someplace very special. Some people put it on their nightstand. Some people put it on their mantle. If you come to our house, it's on our dining room table 365 days a year. Some people put those notes in that, that little box in the stocking. And some people put it under their pillow. Wherever you place them, know that these little pieces of paper are tangible evidence, real proof that our child lived and loved us and that we are rich beyond measure because of the gifts that they shared with us. It's called a blessing box. And I want you to find something to put in your blessing box this year. It will really help lift the holidays for you. We keep making lists of all the things we will never know and the things that we have lost this year 
I want you to put something in the blessing box. I want you to write down a gift that can never be taken from us, a gift of love, of laughter, of joy. Our children have died, but we did not lose them. Make a blessing box, and in the middle of the night, when you can't remember anything good or decent, you can creep down the stairs and find that box and open it, pull out those little pieces of paper, and be reminded of the life of our children, not just the death. It's dark this holiday season, so let's, let's light a candle. Let's light a very special candle. What kind of a candle can we light? Well, I want to light a candle for hope. I'd like to light a candle for love. I'd like to light a candle for gratitude. Remember that no light that was born in love can ever be extinguished. It's a tradition in our family that the youngest at the table always say the blessing. It's also a tradition in our family, because we're military, that if we're lucky enough to have our, our military member at home, that we invite other people who weren't so lucky and aren't able to be at home to come and have, have dinner with us. So that Thanksgiving after Big A died, Tony had, had been away and was able to come back for a few days of R&R, &R, rest and recreation. It was mostly just a tear fest for us. But he had invited a number of military members. I think he took a bus and just went out to the barracks, parked it in the parking lot, and stood outside and yelled, Turkey, get on. And we probably had 25 people in our living room waiting for dinner. Foreign officers, student pilots, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, just all kinds of, of soldiers who were hungry or had come to our house for dinner, poor people. And while I'm fixing the last part of the dinner, I, I grabbed Allie and I said, you know, it's a tradition that the youngest say the blessing. And she said, well, I'm not saying it this year. And I said, well, but you're the youngest again. She said, I know that. But I have nothing to be thankful for, Mother. God took our baby. He took our brother. And I'm not very thankful for that. And I looked at her and I thought, hmm, how come kids can say what we grown-ups are thinking? I said, but it's a tradition, and my mother said I could make you do it. So when you become a mom, you can make your daughter do it. And she grumbled at me, and she said, oh, all right. But I'm not saying that blessing at dinner. I said, well, when are you going to say that blessing? She said, well, I'll, I'll say it at dessert. And I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for dessert. So we somehow got through the dinner. I don't know how. I was still frozen. And finally I heard this little voice say, serve the pie, serve the pie. So I served the pie, and I looked at her, and I said, do you have a blessing you'd like to share? She said, do I have to? I said, yes. She said, oh, all right. I have a blessing. But first, I want all of us to hold hands like the Waltons. You could tell how long ago this has been. And Tony leaned over and whispered to me, not very quietly, I don't like the Waltons. They're too happy. I said, I don't like them either, but hold hands. Just do it. And then I had to look out at this sea of, of strangers in our table. And we'd had a good evening, but can you imagine having Thanksgiving dinner with people who cried through the whole dinner? And I had to explain to them that it was an American custom. We had some foreign officers that we always cry at Thanksgiving, and, and we always hold hands. And, and I asked them to join us. And I, they did. I think they were afraid. I think if they figured if they joined hands, we could have pie quick and they could get out of there. And so they held hands, and we made this little circle around our tables. And if you're sitting next to someone right now listening to this, why don't you just reach out and hold their hand, just their hands, for just a minute. And if you're alone, just imagine that there are so many of us sitting now in a circle holding hands. And this is the prayer that Allie gave that night so long ago. Thanks, God, for the little while. And that's all she said. I had been sitting there thinking of all the things I would never know, making a mental list of the things that would never be. And she reminded me, and now you, it wasn't long enough. If your child was never born, you wanted them to come to this plane. We had dreams and hopes for them. We could feel them in our tummy. We wanted them here. If your child was 12, we wanted 13 years. If your child was 28, I wanted 30. It was never going to be long enough, but it was something, 
and don't you dare lose the moments that we had together. I think the truly bereaved are those who never knew love at all, and you and I are rich beyond measure, because somebody loved us, and we loved them back, and we still do. So thanks for the little while. Thank you for life, for its good times and bad. Thank you for the love, even when I can't feel it. Thank you for the love I used to share, for the arms that held me tight. Thank you for my family in faraway places, in different times. Thank you for the songs we sang, for the dreams we saved, for the smiles we shared. Thank you for the strength that eludes me just now. Thank you for the weakness that sends me to my knees. Thank you for the searching, the reaching, the hoping. Thank you for the bonds of memory that hold me in place in this universe, even when I don't believe in it anymore or forget what it's all about. Thank you most of all for having been blessed with the love I have known, even now when I fear I will forget it. Thank you for the memory and for filling it full measure for me. It wasn't nearly long enough, but it will have to do. Thanks for the moments we danced. Thanks for the little while. No matter what holiday it is for you, no matter what season of grief, light a candle of celebration of the life we lived. Remember the joy of their love and let it glow within you this holiday season and always. They lived, we loved them, and we still do. May you find hope and peace and ways to remember the life of your child, not just the death. May love be what you remember the most this season and always. Love and hugs from me to you. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Darcy. I love the idea of a blessing box. Um, how about a couple of questions, Dars? Okay, let's see what we got. Okay. Um, how, how do you honor your child during the holidays without making everyone else feel uncomfortable? <laughs> you probably can't, but in a way, I think people are waiting for us to do something. I think they would like to join us in honoring our child. So if we set the stage and lead the parade, I think people will join us, if you want them to. But if you don't want other people to, then have a private moment, a private celebration, whether that's going to the grave and, and eating a gingerbread cookie or decorating it or buying that toy and, and having a moment. Do something. Don't cancel the whole holidays because we're so afraid of what other people will think. We can always beg forgiveness. Don't ask permission. Just Ask them to join you in sharing a memory and remembering your child's life. It isn't about their death at all. It's always been about their life. Absolutely. What, what should I do if my baby died and I don't have the memories to miss, rather the lack of memories in watching him grow up and share in the holidays? Uh, that is so hard. But you have your hopes and your dreams for what you had for that child and they will become the memories that we had. The imagination, the things we imagined we were going to do with them. What did you imagine this child would grow up to be? What did you imagine you were going to do on that first holiday? And maybe you do that. Maybe you go buy a toy that you would have. You never got to buy one, so buy one now and give it away to another child who doesn't have a mom to get one from. We are always, always blessed with the love of our children, whether we actually got to hold them in our arms or only in our hearts. Hmm. Maureen asks, uh, how do you respond to all the clerks and people wishing you happy holidays when you don't feel very happy? 
George Carlin had a wonderful thought. He said, I don't want to be happy. I don't like being happy. It's almost like an ob obligation to be happy. Do you know, they have no idea who's standing in front of them. They have no idea what history you and I are bringing to that cash register. So I just nod and say, thank you, and I hope you have a happy holiday as well. They have no idea. If you burst into tears, it's okay. If you smile, it's okay. I wouldn't throw anything at them. They're just trying to be helpful. And to be very honest with you, especially Pat, in early grief, I was grateful anybody talked to me. Because most of the people I knew when they saw me in the stores turned that basket around and went the other way. Yes. So just having anybody say something to me was nicer than the silence that we are often treated to. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, how do you handle the anger of survivor's guilt from a sibling of the deceased? Are you asking this as the sibling or as the parent of a sibling? There's a lot of anger, even, even parental survival grief and sibling survival grief. Anger is such a natural part of grief. It's not a nice part, but it is a natural part. I think the first thing we need to do is figure out exactly what we're angry at. Are we angry that we have been left alone? Are we angry that no one is remembering that we're still here? Often the surviving siblings become invisible as their parents are so caught in their own grief they don't even see their surviving children. Anger can be very, very powerful destructive force or constructive force. Remember, we can turn that anger at any time into something constructive. Maybe we change the way things are. Many social systems were changed because someone was angry and said, that's not right, that's not fair. So take that energy and see if we can do something to build something, to change the way things are done. If someone is ignoring you, see if you can get their attention in a positive way. See if you can get your own attention in a positive way. But don't dismiss the anger. It's a valuable piece for us. It gives us the energy to keep moving. Find some way to build something, not destroy it. Great, great. Um, question here. Any chance we can get a copy of Darcy's beautiful poem? <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's available right now on Facebook and you can see that address at the bottom of the screen. It's also available on the website and we've already posted it there. And I appreciate you letting me read that. It was, it was written after Allie said that little prayer that night. I was laying in bed thinking of how simple was her prayer. Thanks for the little while. And those words just showed up. I'm not a poet, but I just managed to catch those words out of the universe. So they're available, and please feel free to use them as you wish. We'll go ahead and post it to our Facebook page also. Oh, well, thank you. Um, just a, a point here that somebody wants to say that they're going to the Compassionate Friends Candle Lighting Ceremony, which is held the second Sunday of December, and they're looking forward to it, but they're also afraid that it'll be very hard. It will be hard, because we should all be home making gingerbread cookies and wrapping presents, not standing in the freezing cold or the rain or the snow or the wind or wherever you're going to be standing and lighting a candle for our child. It is hard. Grief is hard. There's nothing easy about it. But don't miss the opportunity to gather with all of us, your family, and to light a candle not in memory of someone, but in thank you, in gratitude, I like to think that our children are, are watching us. I know we're very, very proud of them. I hope they're very proud of us. And I like to think that that night, when those waves of light just come across all over the world, we light those candles. Every bereaved parent, every bereaved sibling, grandparent are lighting those candles, and it comes in waves that we are joining this huge burst of light, a light of love, a light of thank you for the little while. Mm. So true. Um, this question is, what if I meet an old friend who is not aware of my child's death and he asks how my child is doing? It's hard when you're newly bereaved, isn't it? 
Darcy, you have a question or an answer for that one? Ah, looks like we lost our sound again. Okay. I'm sorry, I just lost you for a moment. You must have gone into cyberspace. Yeah, I'm sorry. It sounds like we're having a little trouble with the sound tonight. Um, what if I meet an old friend who's not aware of my child's death and he asks how my child is doing? Take a breath before you answer and then answer directly. This person does not know your child is dead and there's no easy way to tell them and say, I'm so sorry to have to tell you this. My child died. Tell them when and very brief died in a car accident died of a long-term illness, whatever comes out of your mouth, that's all you have to say. You will be instantly hugged. You will be instantly enveloped in that loved one's friendship. An old friend is how you describe that person. Will they be embarrassed and mortified? Maybe, maybe not. But give them the opportunity to give you an expression of love and of sympathy. Do not pretend that your child is fine and that your child is away at college. That's not fair. Give them the opportunity to hug you and to support you. Mm -hmm. um, one last question here. What's the best way to ask people to remember our child whether, rather than avoid the mention of our child's name? By modeling that behavior. So many people are afraid to say our child's name, so you say the name. Leave the scrapbooks open on the table when they come over. Don't hide those things away. Your child occupies a space in your life. Maybe not a physical space anymore, but an emotional and psychological space. If have you ever noticed we talk about our children in the present tense, it's because they're still present to us. So model that behavior. Invite them to share a memory with you. Especially if they have, maybe, maybe your child went over and had a slumber party at their house and you never found out about that or maybe they drove them to summer camp or dropped them off at college together or it was the coach of the football team. Do you have a memory of, of my son that you would be willing to share with me? We are hungry for memories. So play the I remember game. Ask them. They are holding gifts and treasures for us and I know they want to help us. They just don't know how. So sometimes we need to invite them to share a story and a memory with us. I totally agree. We actually ask people to to uh, share a memory with us. Uh, when we first uh, started sending out holiday cards again, we ask in that first card, will you share a memory of the children with us? And um, it was great. It was really great to get those. Wasn't it wonderful to open that card and get a memory instead of just a signed, you know, John and Mary? Absolutely. Ask people for those memories. Oh. They've got them and they want to give them. They're just not sure it's okay to. Yeah, it was. It was. It's very special. Very, very special. Well, Darcy showed some of her books that she has written um, a little bit earlier in the slides. Uh, and I should have had you mention some of the, can you mention the names of your books, Dars? Oh my goodness, well, um, let me see if I could go backwards. I don't know if I can go backwards. Am I allowed to go backwards? Oh, maybe okay. I can. There okay, let me run backwards. Footsteps Through Grief is a little tiny book with lots of little inspirational sayings. What Color is Dead is a, is a DVD for grown-ups about how to talk to kids. Finding Your Way Through Grief is a CD. It's not me and Allie singing. It's a, it's a talk about different personality styles. Touchstones, little tiny pocket full of hope. Got 30 different little cards you can carry in your pocket. A Place for Me is a meditation tape. If you'll see, it's for grieving kids ages 8 to 80. That means it works for all of us. Mm. And let's see, Footsteps Through Grief, that's a good book if you're newly bereaved. The Other Side of Grief is a book that's really good if you're moving through your grief and wondering if it's okay to start to be happy again. And then, of course, I, these two books I wrote with Bob Bauer, they were such fun to write. The Crying Handbook, all about the myths and mysteries of crying, and, and you really don't have to cry in order to heal. And then In the Midst of Caregiving is a book about if you are taking care of someone currently, it's a book of support for you. 
And then you get to do the two classics, Why Are the Casseroles Always Tuna, which was my first one. By actual count, 27 tuna casseroles on the counter within hours after Big A's death. I cannot serve tuna to this day, Pat, without somebody in my family <laughs> saying who died. And then if I could just see hope, because someone asked me what hope looked like. And I said, if I knew what it looked like, I'd go find it. So I had to write a book on what it was like. Hmm. And they can get those where? They can get those at the grief store at Grief Incorporated website www.griefinc.com or come visit us on Facebook and it will show you how to order all of those. They're also available in bookstores, but it's so much more fun to talk to me or Tony, so give us a call and we'll, we'll send it out to you. Super. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you so much and have a happy holiday, whichever holiday it is for each of you. May love be what you remember the most. Mm. You too. Our webinars are recorded and posted on the Compassionate Friends website, www.compassionatefriends.org. Our next webinar will take place on December 10th, when Carla Blowy will present the program, Dreams, a Blessing in Disguise. When you visit the Compassionate Friends website, you can find a local chapter of the Compassionate Friends and a wealth of grief-related information, as well as links to our Facebook and Twitter pages. Good night, Darcy, and good night, everyone, and be well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>